Hey, Power Athlete Nation. Welcome to another episode of the Premier Podcast on Strength and Conditioning. I'm John. And Tex here. Hello. And we are Power Athlete Radio, and we're coming at you live and direct with some questions from our followers. You know, a couple years ago, we started this deal called the Hotline, and you can reach out, you can leave questions, you can text, you can even send some, you know, scantily clad pictures to Mr. McQuilkin and I. Please don't. <laughs> and that number is 929-464-4640, 929-ing-ing-0. And that's the hotline. So if you have questions, we got answers, shoot them on over and we'll answer them. Tex, who do we have today? Well, they didn't leave their name, mm. but I will tell you this. They have a very dense question, but it's about programming. Ooh, I love dense questions. So we are lining ourselves up like, to get like how deep. dense, like uh, like is th- like dense as brisket, dense, denser, wetter, juicier. Mm. We can't wait for this because we're basically going to wind you up on programming and set you free a little bit. Mm, I like to, it. to show off our individual here is programming for themselves Mm. and number one rule as a coach don't program for yourself that is correct follow the secret squirrel method so let's go ahead and drop this question before we get into anything else because honestly i'm excited for this because we get to drop some knowledge ready ready let's do it what's up guys uh i had a question about daily undulating periodization as written about by pavel um I've been implementing it in my training by treating intensity and volume as two independent variables that oscillate randomly within a range every training day. I still follow a linear progression, but I'm going to up or down adjust volume and or the load, i.e. intensity, um, and sometimes neither, within a range based on a randomized schedule. So far, it seems to be working. I'm making progress week over week, uh, and it seems to keep me and my training fresh. I like the variation of having some really hard, easy, and moderate days sprinkled in. What's your guys' take on daily undulating periodization? Is it a useful tool, or am I veering way too far into super secret squirrel territory? Uh, by the way, quick movie rec, Stallone's Cobra. I mm. think magnum opus. Thanks, guys. Bye. First of all, the reason I drive a 49 Mercury is because of Stallone's Cobra. Do you guys remember the best part of that entire movie was the 1949 uh, Mercury that he drove uh, that was actually designed by a guy named uh, uh, Dean Bryant, little known fact, Hollywood uh, car builder. I, I got to meet and I actually got to ride in that car. Oh, so wow. pretty Did neat. I know that. Yeah. But that car was uh, was probably the best part of that whole movie was um, him racing through the streets of L.A. in that 1949 Mercury. At that point, like James Dean drove a 1949 Mercury in The Rebel Without a Cause uh, the grease, the guy drove a convertible 49 Merc. So I've always huh. been a bit huge fan of 1949 Mercury's so much so that I have one big grease guy over here. Ah, uh, yeah. I mean, how can you not like grease when they're racing down in the, uh, uh, in the LA river down in the, um, you've never seen that when they're racing. I, down? I, I very much. So I, I grew up with sisters, man. I've seen grease plenty. I just am trying to recall <laughs> Uh, lightning. I don't know. Man. Don't you remember like the bad guy, how he had the black Merc with the flames and it shot flames out the back and it was kind of Vaguely. a tail dragger. Yeah, that. No, that was a 49 Merc. But yeah, Whatever. that was uh, also gone in 60 seconds Had a 49 Merc in it, Mercury as well. So pretty cool, iconic car. But I definitely like that movie. One of my favorites. But let's get into something. Yes. All right. So he talks about Pavel and he talks about undulating periodization and linear progression. Now, the way we define linear progression here at Power Athlete, and especially the way we use it within our Bedrock program, has to do with keeping volume, and in, or really it's it's volume constant. So the sets and reps are constant, the movements are constant, and what we do is we do a basic linear progression by adding weight to the bar, thus increasing load and tonnage over time within uh, you know training days from, from week to week. Mm-hmm. And yeah, we locked in for five movements, and along with sprinting. And that's that's almost the X factor when we talk about our linear progression because we are putting on so much muscle mass. Yeah. The athletes are becoming a new individual and we help coordinate it all with the sprint. So we found that with a fairly unadapted nervous system, an individual could handle this program. Now, if you've been training with any amount of time and have any type of exposure to lifting weights, a program like this is way too intense. And when I say that, people are always like, what do you mean? It sounds so easy. I'm like, five basic movements. You're going to lift three by five on our compound movements. 
And each time you come in, you're going to add at least two and a half, five pounds to the bar. So it might be light today, but also in 10 weeks, this is going to be soul crushing. Mm -hmm. And we found that there is a very, very real window, this unadapted novice beginner amateur window that lasts somewhere between uh, 18, 20, 20 weeks with some resets where somebody can put on a lot of strength very, very quickly, as long as we're real focused and we know exactly where we're going. And what I worry about many times is that people that are fairly new to lifting weights fuck around and waste this opportunity. So I want to basically set up, we do a a back squat, we got a press, we got a bench, we got a deadlift and we have a power clean. And then we have uh, our, you know, accessory movements. We do a ton of body weight, but we also found that that stimulus works very well when we incorporate some form of high intensity sprinting. Mm Mm-hmm. So we pair that up. That is our bedrock program. Any new athlete to the barbell, we direct them there. And especially if you are a teenager and that's your first exposure, we drop you there. So it's uh, based on the model that we use for the bedrock program. It's kind of confusing when you start looking at undulating periodization. The idea that you're really alternating between different uh, you know, levels of volume and intensity. Usually it's a high volume, low intensity day alternated with a high intensity, low volume day. When I say intensity, I don't necessarily mean an emotional intensity, but I mean intensity by a percentage of weight on the bar of a one RM. Yeah. And I want to throw some rules out for Pavel's approach to. So, so for those of you guys that don't yeah, know Pavel, Jim. he's, um, uh, Russian, or at least he claims of Russian lineage. I don't know if he's really Russian or not. I've never met him. Uh, but he went and translated a bunch of texts and had a, a pretty popular book a couple of years ago, maybe more than 10, called Power to the People. And it was real basic, five by five floor yeah, press. 2000, five John. Yeah. 2000. Oh, geez, I'm dating myself. It was like a five by five floor press and a five by five deadlift in alternating days. So his program has always just been very basic, very simple, very consistent. And um, he's also a big kettlebell guy. So mm-hmm. that's kind of where a lot of people first heard his name was for the RKC and the kettlebells. And, uh, you know, so I, I used to come across periodically kettlebell workouts that he put out and I thought, um, it's all pretty, pretty good stuff. Yeah. And I, I, I'm not mad at these rules that he's got in place. So quick one with his undulating periodization. Number one, pick basic exercises. I like it. Squat, bench, deadlift, much like we described in our bedrock approach. Sure. Then we have only choose one type of movement per cycle. So that rule in place and getting to our caller's question, we start to see some secret squirreling already, even with Pavel's approach. Then next rule we got here, set up your week. So you work each exercise with different ranges. I'm going to give an example of a, of Pavel's approach here in a minute. And then finally his fourth approach, don't go nuts on accessory work. Hmm. So, I mean, as they stand here, I'm not mad at any of these. Yeah, I mean, it's it, it's pretty basic. Um, I think where the linear progression comes in is if you're kind of following this light, meaty, head, or it would be like a heavy, light, medium, which is, uh, you know, how Mark Ripto does his Texas method, for example. Um, you know, the like five by five sets, and that would be your heavy day. And then you come in and you do a light day. And then there's obviously a medium day, which is a little lower in the intensity and higher volume. Uh, but the idea that you're following some basic linear progression, which just means that you're adding weight to the bar each time that maybe a certain day comes up. So I think that makes sense. What I found actually works better, at least for our population, and we have thousands of data points that suggest this, um, is really kind of based off of what I call gambler sets, where we ask athletes to come in and work up to a certain rep max and then do a drop set based on you know what they were able to hit that day and then the next day which would be kind of a form of undulating periodization we come mm-hmm. back and do a bunch of cat work which is usually uh you know time domains uh you know 90 seconds rest you know compensatory acceleration trying to move the bar with max intensity and max speed at a reduced rate yeah so that's you're getting into rep max so that would be something we've prescribed to a trained athlete once they've yep. exhausted that linear progression then we get into the juicy, the fun of the the power athlete template. Um, so, well, the uh, the the reason I kind of went to rep maxes was I got really tired mm-hmm. of like basing everything off of an imaginary one RM. That's so. Like for example, if you were to say, okay, hey, I'm going to start my undulating periodization with a squat at eighty, you know, five by five at eighty percent of your one RM. Okay, how do we know how accurate your one RM is? We found that beginners, for the most part, had no adaptation to do one RMs and most people don't really handle one RMs well. So a lot of times you're either picking a weight that's either too heavy or a weight that's too late to drive adaptation. 
by picking rep maxes, we were able to really get to where we needed to a lot faster. So I base everything on rep maxes a lot more than percentages. And then when we do the cat work, I'll take a percentage of that rep max Mm -hmm. because I found that percentages only last for about seven days. Yeah. And this comes from doing years of classical periodization where we would test a one RM, do 16 weeks of training, test one RMs again. And all of a sudden we were kind of hoping to God that somehow there'd be some super compensation and we'd have a great training day. And a lot of times at the end of that 16 weeks wasn't necessarily our best. There were points during the training cycle where I felt best. I felt strong. The weights felt light. And I always liked the ability to, you know, no one to hold them, no one to fold them, you know, take the gambler sets and then shoot for these rep maxes. So everybody adapts at a different rate. Everybody's got a different level of recovery and everybody's able to handle volume and intensity in different ways. Mm -hmm. So shackling people based off of percentages doesn't always allow everybody to to flourish. And then when you start looking at outliers, you know, and if you're designing program right on that bell curve, the outliers are always going to miss out, which what I saw happen in college all the time. All the time. All the time. So that's what we have here is our sample week. It does rely on percentages of 1RM. Yeah. But you see the wave and the volume, as I'll explain it, of intensity. Yeah. I mean, uh, um, undulating periodization has been known as waving for as uh-huh. long as I, you know, as long, as long as I've been hearing about it. And I think every person, unless they're a beginner following some form of bedrock, understands the waving of the volume and intensity. You can't come in and, you know, bang out 90% of your 1RM every single day. I mean, well, you we, can try. We, we did it with the Bulgarian Power Athlete Program. And uh, I think it was like 18 days in a row. I squatted between 500 and 600 for singles and absolutely shattered. And I think a lot of people do, especially in that type of programming. So you got to be smart. You got to be able to alternate with volume and intensity. And you got to know and plan those days so that when they come up, you're prepared for them. Yes. All right. So sample week that are, I imagine, we didn't get specifics from our individual, but based off what he shared and our experience with Pavel's approach, this would be an example. So session one, we got three movements basic movements following the line we're going to go with squat bench and deadlift all week so session one we're going to squat five by five 80 percent of his one rm then we're going to bench four sets of eight reps 70 percent and then finish deadlift six sets three reps 70 percent so session two of that week now our deadlift is up for five by five at 80 percent the squat rotates down for four sets of eight reps, 70%. Bench rotates down for six sets, three reps, 70%. Then as you can imagine, session three, the bench jumps up to five sets of five at 80. Deadlift down to four sets of eight at 70. Squat, six sets of three at 70. And session four would finish with some, as Power Athlete would describe, uh, primal movement pattern, accessory work, and some unilateral action. So strict Vertical press, vertical pull-ups, horizontal pull, so bent over rows, and some dumbbell curls, tricep pushdowns, calf raises, or we'd probably throw in some more Bulgarian split squats and some action with the single leg. Personally, some lunges, but uh, that'd be a session four. What I think the individual that our caller is doing now is on those five by fives to lead off each day, adding a linear progression. Well, he could also be week. adding weight to any of these sets. I mean, I, um, uh, the one thing that really messed my deadlift up was deadlifting more than once a week. Not uh, three times. No, <laughs> I found one heavy deadlift and then, um, another day of dynamic speed pulling actually worked much better or swinging kettlebells or something that involves some form of violent hip extension. Um, you know, obviously the squatting doesn't really bother me three days a week. The benching two days a week and not a really focus on any overhead pressing would be where I would kind of mix it up. I throw at best, I throw one heavy bench in and maybe, uh, you know, one overhead pressing day. And then on my third day, I'd probably throw up some accessory, hit some dumbbells and a few other things or close grips and then some, a uh, bunch of dumbbell overhead pressing work. So, um, I think that there's a very real, uh, time frame for this program with an individual, maybe somebody who's, you know, not necessarily who's kind of in that twilight, who's, uh, you know, coming off of something like a basic linear progression, who's following this. And he's probably looking at like five by five strong lifts following something like this, or, you know, Jim Wendler's five, three, one fits, um, which actually I like, uh, you know, I like the idea of being able to go and do some max sets. The only problem is I think people on gym stuff don't progress 
fast enough. Like I'll see people be like, oh, my last edit, you know, 90%, I was able to get 16 reps. And I'm like, well, you got to add more weight to the bar. So I think that there's definitely um, some really interesting intermediate programs uh, personally. Uh, is this the way I would program? No, especially. And I think also where I would get, I, we gave squat bench and deadlift as the example. I think based off my interpretation of the call, he's mixing up those movements every week. So he's using I, a kind of a, a uh, undulating periodization mixed with a conjugate system. So, uh, and a linear progression, but he's constantly very functional. Yeah. <laughs> uh, like at the end of the day, uh, at least in power athlete land, I look at seven primal patterns and then I challenge those primal patterns, X, Y, and Z that uh, step squat lunge, uh-huh. so, uh, some form of hinging overhead press, horizontal press, uh, vertical, uh, vertical pull, horizontal pull. And then based on that, how you skin it with volume and intensity, we found that being able to move through different rep maxes allows for us to be able to find some percentages for our cat work and then, you know, mix in a ton of accessory work with unilateral movements. And for the most part, we fix a lot of the imbalances. Oh, yeah. So, and similar to Pavel, as it lays out, it's a take a movement first approach to the programming and then get into the the reps and finally the loads to to drive spe- the adaptation that you are desiring with this program. And you are talking to the caller here. Weren't specific. You said you think it's progressing? Question mark. No, he said everything's working well. I think everything's going great. The problem until, until it doesn't. But I mean, I always go with the Louis Simmons. Um, just because something's working doesn't mean that you're not leaving a lot on the table. And just because something is working doesn't mean that it's optimal. So I really think uh, a lot of times when we run into people, it's like, you know, you put five pounds in your bench in a year. Did you get stronger? Yes. Could you have done a lot better over that same time period? 100%. And a lot of times you just have to understand who you are as an athlete. Can you handle handle volume? Can you handle intensity? What does that look like on a day? Uh, you know, what are the limitations on the movements that you're selecting? And are you know, is the technique good? I mean, there's so many other variables that we should probably analyze before we start looking at the program. Like, I think any program executed well will produce results for that individual or for at least a few individuals and others. It'll shatter on the rocks. You just have to be able to look and say, you know, what's the program? What's the desire? What's your desired outcome? And how do you want to move there? The, what you are saying, you're laying out a lot of the power athlete principles as we teach in the methodology. Yeah. Individualization, accelerated adaptation. And that's honestly the beauty of the, the, the bedrock, the linear progression approach is you see all these power athlete principles laid out in the program. And by the end of it, you find out exactly who you are as an athlete and you're not left wondering which program is this working because you know what clicking feels like you know what overload and when you are set up we set you up to fail underneath the three by five that's part of the whole progress process and development as an athlete so that way it does not leave you questioning if a program is working or not that's one little thing a uh, bonus for the bedrock program. Oh yeah. Cause you know exactly who the hell you are. Oh yeah. No, when people come out the other side of bedrock, I mean, we've had people put 200 pounds on a squat in 20 weeks, which I know you're mm-hmm. going to say, Oh, that seems fantastic. But no, I've seen it happen. You bring in somebody who's relatively unadapted has never trained. You get them underneath the barbell. The adaptation of strength happens so quickly. And then all of a sudden it stops. And at that point, you come to a fork in the road and you got to make a decision on where you go, either increase central nervous system efficiency or work on create, you know, larger cross-sectional size of a muscle. So you got to build bigger muscles because theoretically a larger cross-sectional size of a muscle will be able to support more weight. So there's a few factors and we got some programs designed for it. But for the most part, uh, I have never seen a program more potent at that point for a beginner than the bedrock program. Um, man, I remember when we first you know, we used to run this amateur progression on the cross the football page and the results that people got were absolutely astounding. Well, there was a lot of mistakes as well. So it was late. which was good, though, because yes. there were because of the mistakes that the people were making and the mistakes that I was making. Uh, I think what it really allowed us to do. And, and I, I always go back in time and I think um, there will never be another point in the world like this where things were 
such a wild west in terms of training within the internet. I mean, we were able to put out a free program and have thousands of people a day follow it and give us all those data points. Now uh, that world doesn't exist anymore. So the other cool part is then we got to sell seminars and then travel and meet all those people Mm -hmm. all over the world and the results and the comments and the thoughts, the feedback were universal. It didn't matter if it was in Hong Kong, uh, Oslo, Norway, or New Zealand, the people, you know, all across this globe, the people that followed that training program had the results and everybody would come over with the exact same look and the exact same story. I don't know if I was doing this right, but I, you know, had these amazing results and it's because we were able to hit the right program at the right time. And then what happens is then you have to progress and you got to move on. And the one thing that we really noticed was the lack of sprinting, the lack Uh of speed being the huge discerning factor. When I see people train, you know, and I, you know, we, we do, I mean, not within, um, obviously within the power athlete feeds on all the programs, people post videos, Instagram, social media, constantly seeing and getting tagged with stuff. Uh, the one thing which I think differentiates power athlete from all the other programs is the speed at which people are able to move the barbell and move through space. Like when I watch a lot of people train, I watch a lot of stuff, man, people just look fucking slow, man. Like uh, old people having sex slow and careful. And when I see people at power athlete and I see the videos, I see people ripping the bar off the ground, trying to break bars in half. And, uh, there's a certain element of violence. Um, and in determination and focus, and then this idea of moving with a intentive purpose. Mm-hmm. And that's important to me. Yes. 100% that movement through space, going back to power ethic principles and then leading to the definition of athleticism, the seamless and effortless combination of primal movement patterns through space to accomplish a known or a novel task. So my guidance for our caller here. Hey, if you're seeing progress and feeling good and moving pain free on this program, hit it. I would encourage you to challenge some sprints, some plyometrics, some um, different expressions of movement through space. And if you don't have that that push, that pop and the ability to control your body through space, then we can find different programming opportunities for you to realize if this is progressing, because. I mean, based off what we're seeing here, you, you're going to be see, secret squirreling it forever. But we got a lot of tools that are dialed in for you to the help guide and improve your movement through yeah. space. Powerathlete.com backslash training. We got a whole bunch of choices. HQ.com. Oh, sorry. Powerathletehq.com backslash training. We got a lot of choices and a lot of uh, help out there. So don't fret it. You don't have to secret squirrel it. You can jump in. We got a ton of programs. And, uh, you and know, questions are encouraged. Yes. So if you need I any coach, any coach that's following, I either direct them personally to Bedrock or Field Strong so they can learn how to program for athletes. This goes for any parent, any high school coach or strength and conditioning owner. There is so much to learn with those two programs for applying to others. And if you're looking to understand strength and conditioning, there's no better place to look than those two and following it, not just reading it, following it. Yep. I think that's pretty good, Mr. Tex. Cool. All right. Well, on that note, uh, if you got any questions, remember, reach out to the hotline 929-464-4640, 929-ING-ING-0. So reach out, leave us some questions, hit us with uh, anything you got. If you want to text it over, call it over, you know, hugs and loves, whatever you got, we'll take it. And uh, hopefully if it's good and it sparks our interest, we'll answer it here. And Thanks for joining us for another episode of the Premier Podcast on Strength Conditioning, Power Athlete Radio. And we, if you want to leave us a review, oh. we welcome it. Or leave us a love voicemail. John, I got to play this to send off the show. <sighs> this is a familiar voice. Okay. Voice of an angel. Power Athlete Radio. You guys are super rad. Love it hug. The rules to success. I love that podcast. This shit's super rad. Love it hug. Dude. You got to control the volume on that guy. Hey, he's the guy that turned us on to Matthew Modine. So got to you know, give it to him. Yeah, I appreciate it. But yeah, hey, uh, I did forget about the iTunes review. So whatever you listen to, however you're getting your podcast, whatever it is, YouTube, Spotify, whatever it looks like, you can go on and leave us a review. So as long as it's five stars, you can leave it. And we'll be happy to, uh, if it's good, we'll happy to read it here on Power Athlete Radio. Bye. Now it's time for you to empower your performance. 
Head to PowerAthleteHQ.com backslash training to choose from a number of programs to meet your specific performance goals. And if you like to break a mental sweat too, visit academy.powerathletehq.com and become a real stakeholder in you or your athlete's success. Until next time, bye!